you know that we talked about on the phone. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about pre-war life. You were raised in Germany, is that right? That's right. We're going to talk a little bit about pre-war life, what you remember. I know you escaped, is that right? Yes, we escaped. A couple of weeks before Kristallnacht. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, what you remember, what your experience was like in Germany uh, during the creation of the Third Reich, and we're going to talk a little bit about what you remember. Uh, you were born in 1922? Yes. Okay, so you escaped at 12? 16. 16. Okay. My math is bad. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about what you can remember. If that's okay right. with you? Yeah. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your family. Well, it was on my mother, my father, myself, and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. really the same house. We had a, hard, a hardware store, and uh, it was going very nicely. And be, it, even when Hitler came, nothing really changed, because people respected my father. And what I can remember is the boycott. I was coming home from school for lunch because the school was two blocks away. And I saw that the store was closed. And in front of me was our doctor. So I ran after him and says, what happened to my grandmother? There's nothing. Well, the store is closed. Something must have happened. Oh, he says, I don't know. But he was a Nazi. And... Uh, How do you know he was a Nazi? He always wore the... The swastika. The swastika. And he was your doctor? He was our doctor, yeah. To the end. To the end? To the end, yeah. He never... Uh, refused to come when we needed him. And uh, so at that time they had some uh, men in uniform walking up and down in front of the store and my father came out with his medals and he said to them, which one of you gentlemen can show me this? He had the Iron Cross. And they apologized, and they said, Mr. Marx, keep your store closed for today. And they left. The Nazis apologized yeah. because he showed them an iron cross. Right. What do you think that meant to them? That they were a little bit ashamed. The Nazis were? Yeah. So they because they were youngsters and they knew my father all their lives. I mean, maybe early 20s, maybe even not. So they were following orders. They, they were, were following they were orders, yes. But you got the feeling they really didn't want to be doing that. No. That's why they left. So they asked him to keep it closed for the rest of the day, and maybe to protect him. Yeah. But he did. He did. What was going on in your home that night? and you recognized a boycott was starting. Do you remember? Well, we kept behind the doors. Do you we remember stayed what you inside. About, what your parents no, explained to you? No, they, they didn't. They didn't talk much to me mm -hmm. about it. And to this day, I really, in a way, what can I say? I regret the fact that they were never open to me and did talk to me about what was going on. Just pick it up. Thanks. Sorry. That's a phone? It's, it's on vibrate. It's, it was supposed to be on the carpet. <laughs> we'll get past that. So you were saying that you have feelings that your parents didn't share with you. Did you do you look at it now? Are you a mother? Am I a mother? Yes, I have so two do you, sons. Do you look at it now as a mother that maybe she was, they were protecting you? Yes, as I was protecting them. I didn't talk too much about the 
And last year, the town invited us, and we got two tickets. And I took my oldest son with me. The town invited you where? To come back to the city. From Germany. From Germany. They invited you here in Tennessee. They invited... No, from Tennessee to go to Germany. They invited you back to Germany. Yeah. For what? For get together with all the surviving Jews from the town. And was that the first time you talked yes. about it with your children? No, I mean, they knew they what knew. was going on, but they didn't realize just how much there was mm -hmm. in property. My son couldn't get over it. it it really floored him. And your daughter? Oh, you have two sons? Two sons. And did, so you brought them back with you, both of them? Did no, either just one. Of them one. Come with you? Just one? So tell me, when the boycott started, do you remember when that was? Yeah, it was on Hitler's birthday in 1933. 1933. Yeah. So, with the boycott, things began to change drastically. Not really. No, not for you? Not for us. People still came into the store. Um, we had a very decent mayor. Um, and people came, uh, we were treated as nothing happened. The only thing is they said, if they're marching, somebody should be watching, should be looking out of the window. Do you remember any of the restrictions that were placed on the Jews in Germany? Not until 34, mm -hmm. when I was in the pool one day, and a youngster came in who was visiting a Jewish boy, and he said to us, there's a sign outside, Jews are forbidden, you know, Juden verboten. So I said, oh, come on, you know, we, would, we came in. There was nothing on the door. Sure enough, when we went out, there was a sign on. So that was really the first kick in the pants. What did you think when you saw that sign? What were you thinking was happening? It's beginning. Were you surprised? Yes. What were you most surprised about? That they would do something like that to us. So you went home? Did you talk to your talked parents to about parents what you saw? parents about it. And uh, it so happened that the people who were for us going into the pool went on vacation. And they were not at there, so they put the sign up. So the money that my father contributed towards the pool, he got back. They made him give them him the money back. Do you and find that interesting that they put Juden for Boden on the door, but they gave a Jewish man back his money? Yeah. Why do you think that is? because they respected my father very much. But he was Jewish. What I'm getting at is, I understand what you're saying. He was still Jewish, and I know during that time, even the most respected citizens were being robbed of everything. What do you think your father had besides respect and admiration? What do you think it was that they singled him out in some ways and treated him better? I have no idea. But you said you even had a Nazi doctor to take care of your family. Family. I remember once he came to, my grandmother was ill, and he came in and he had the pin on, the Nazi, you know, the cross. And he's examining my grandmother in the back, her lungs, and he's not coming out. And my mother and my aunt and I were looking at each other. What is he doing behind the back? When he came out from behind the back, from listening to my grandmother's lungs, he had removed the pin. He removed it. So you think there was a sense of shame? Yeah. 
And my grandmother used to really curse Hitler. And we said to the doctor, please, doctor, don't. I'm sorry, she used to what? Curse Hitler. Curse Hitler, OK. And uh, he, he said, this is my patient, and I respect her. Do you find that extraordinary, that a Jewish family in Germany was treated differently by the Nazis? Well, most of the people, with few exceptions, were treated decently, till finally they got a new mayor. And who was the new mayor? He was a Nazi. As a youngster, he was no good. Then he joined the Nazi party very early, and he came back as a mayor. And that's when things changed. People came in and said, we can no longer come through the front door. We will come, but we have to come through the back door and not as often as we used to. But people from out of town still came. Did you witness any brutality in the streets, any? No, sometimes they called you a dirty Jew, the kids, or uh, I remember one of the bookkeepers when, she, when we were leaving that, uh, they threw rocks at us. We walked through the town. How was that? Frightening. But I knew I was going, so. You knew you were leaving? Yeah. And I had to leave school when I was 14. How did you know you were leaving? Did your parents tell you they were preparing to leave? Yeah, yeah. We got our visa. Were you able to tell anybody that you were leaving? Oh, yes. People knew. People came into the store in droves when they knew we were closing. The and they told, they told the Gestapo, who was walking up and down, where to go. And he left. And people had said goodbye. You said they told him where to go. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Go to hell. That's what I thought you meant. I just want to make sure. So the Jewish people actually told a Nazi to go to hell, yeah. and he left. No, not the Jewish people. Oh, the, the, non -Jews. Ger the, ner the German The German non -Jews. people. They said, we're going to say goodbye to Mr. Marx, no matter what you want, what you, uh, if you're walking up and down. It's bad enough that you make him go. We are. And when I was out there last year, they were telling me how good my father was to some of those people. That the other, uh, other firm, the other hardware store, wouldn't give poor people uh, when they came in had no cash to pay on credit, and my father did. And they came to me and they thanked me for it. And some people even brought, I should have brought that, but it's in German, um, bills that they didn't pay because they didn't have the money. And my father let them go, let go, you know, forgot about it at that time. So you left two weeks before Krishnamurti? Yeah, on the 30th of October we left. And you came to? Um, to Bronx. New York. To New York. In the fi on the 5th of November, and we lived in the Bronx until I moved here. How soon after, how long after living in New York, did you know about Kristallnacht? Did you know we what found out about a, a week later. That was talk. And when did you start to know about the the extermination of the Jews? You didn't really, I, not, you gave whatever, you had very little money at the time. My father became a dishwasher 
and I became a maid, and then later on a nanny. And uh, money, but we tried to help. What did you know, not necessarily financially, but how did you feel when you found out that you left before six million Jews were murdered? Guilty. Guilty. Because you Because were we, yeah, we escaped. How do you feel about it now? I still feel at times guilty. When you hear the that, other stories? It, when I hear the stories, yes. So I know when we initially talked, you had trouble recognizing yourself as a survivor. Yeah. Do you feel because? Because we got away ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Even so, we went through, I was kicked out of school, and the kids didn't talk to me anymore. They wouldn't even go into the same train car, you know as I was. These were your friends? These were my friends, the kids that I grew up with, who weren't allowed anymore. And... Uh, Do you remember the, anything special about that time? Did somebody come to you and tell you that they wanted to be near you, but they couldn't? And there was one boy who said, my father said, that he doesn't care what they say. I'm your friend. And he told me that because of my father, he can say that he made millions after the war because my father gave him on credit. As a matter of fact, he still owed money when we left. And your father forgave it? Yeah. So how did he make millions? They had a, he started a big factory, a machine, fa machine parts. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, in Canada business and here business and all over. He was a Russian prisoner of war. When he came back, he became an engineer. And then he started his business. His father kept, I mean, continued his father. It's a small town, it's today, it used to be 3,500 people. Today it's 7,000. Or the whole neighborhood was incorporated. Neighboring villages. What, what, what cities were you near? What major cities? Heidelberg. Heidelberg. How far would you say that was? 20, 25, 30 minutes today in, in, in the Autobahn. And Karlsruhe is also about Were 40 minutes away. Were you surprised to hear what Dachau turned into? Yeah. Actually, a um, cousin of my father's, of my mother's, who was a lawyer, was well known in Frankfurt, and they arrested him and sent him to Dachau. And then they told him he was free to go. And... Uh, that upon liberation? That was in 34, 30, 34. Oh, okay, so before. Before. They had some excuse while they arrested him. Did you have any friends or family that you knew? Oh, yes. Were sent to camp? Oh, yes. Yes, cousins of my mother's and uh, my father's survive. two sisters, and nobody survived. As a matter of fact, uh, my father had a sister in Holland whose husband was born in Holland. And when we left, we left from Rotterdam, and uh, we saw them, and my father said, I'm going to try and get you out. And she said, what for? We are Holland, we're citizen of Holland. And I cannot find a trace of them. They're not in, in, in the Yad Vashem 
There's no, no name isn't in, in the um, Holocaust Memorial. I can't find their name. I can only find the name of the son who was killed. You lived in the Bronx for 54 years. Mm -hmm. In New York, what were the other Jews saying about what was happening? Well, we had our German congregation, and also we tried to do everything that we could. But you didn't know that much. There was no television, there was no, no radio, and you didn't talk about it. You really didn't know how bad it was. We knew that my fa we tried to get my father's other sister out, and we didn't, we tried to get him, get them the visa, but we didn't have any money in the bank, so they wouldn't take us. So my father wrote to Switzerland to his brothers to send the money. So we put the money in the bank, but by that time they were already in Riga and we never heard from them again. How do you suppose your father knew to get your family out? So well, many, so I tell you something, what, what was to him the worst blow, that he knew it was time to go. He was very optimistic, it won't last. I was, I'm a German, I was in the army, I was a sergeant, I was, I fought for four years, what's gonna happen? And my mother was the one who already wanted to go when my uncle went in 35. She says, let's go with them to Palestine. And he said, what for? It's not going to last. But when they came, he was an, a volunteer fireman, and he had a helmet. When they came for his helmet, that's when he knew that things were getting worse. And that's when he decided it was time to ask for a visa. And he wrote to America. And got one. Yeah. When you look back during that time, what do you think you remember the most during your time in Germany when Hitler took over? What do you think you remember the most about that time? Was it the feeling of rejection and betrayal? Rejection, yes, yes, yes. The kids that I grew up with and was with them at Christmas time and birthdays, and I remember having a birthday, I think it was 35 or so, and inviting everybody and nobody showed up, except one girl. And she never belonged to, yeah, she never belonged to the uh, party, this girl, and I'm still friends with her today. You think you were old enough as a child to understand? Not really, and yet you knew, I, after I was, kicked out of high school, gymnasium, they called it. Um, I wasn't four, 15 yet, and you had to be 15. So I had to go to continuation school, where they put kids who graduated from the fifth and sixth grade. And, uh, the teachers, were, they used to send me on, on uh, errands and things like that, just so I wouldn't have to hang around. And uh, they taught us some cooking. And then after, at the same time, the nuns took us in to teach us how to sew, Catholic nuns. And there was one girl who was sitting next to me and her father came 
and said, my daughter's not going to sit next to a Jew. And the nun said, look, your son was at the seminary. And he was kicked out. And not because he was a Nazi, but because he stole. Do you want me to start telling the people what really happened? You have a choice. That either that girl sits next to your daughter, or I'm going to talk. See, there were still decent people around. Do you tell these stories when people talk about the horrors? I talk very little. Why is that? Because I feel that I, I really didn't go through enough as much as the others did. How do you think that takes you out of the era? Because you didn't go to a camp? Yeah. Because you didn't live in a ghetto? Yeah. Because they didn't uh, break windows. Because there were still decent people around. Who spoke to us. Who came to us. I found out last year from one of the men whose father was arrested on the 9th and sent to Dachau. And the, uh, the head of the camp was his captain in the First World War. And the Jew had saved this man's life. And he called him into this office and he said, take your men from your hometown and leave as fast as you can. So you were one of the survivors that yeah. witnessed a lot of the kindness right. of the Germans. Yeah. Well, there were still people who tried to, uh, when I was on my bike, who tried to, to uh, hit me with the bike, to get me off the bike. And, 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 and uh, as a whole, people were afraid to talk to me. My age group, mm -hmm. they were all afraid. But your memories and your experience offer more kindness. Yeah. <clears throat> the Germans have been accused, the non-Nazis, the Germans, have been accused of voluntarily going after the Jews, not by orders of the, the Reich, not for any other reason, not even for nationalistic purposes. They've just been accused of inane cruelty and stepping up and voluntarily that helping in after. the destruction of the Jews. That came do after. You, do you ever think that those people that helped you in 1934 could have changed their opinion and in 1939 participated in the destruction yes, of the definitely. Jewish people? Yes, definitely. How do you feel about that? That those same people... I was there last year and they asked me to speak. And what I said was, I'm back today after 60 some odd years, 64 years. I will tell you that I forgive you, but I will not forget. You forgive them for what? For whatever they did to us. Because there were people there after us. Do you think it's easier for you to forgive because you were not sent to a camp? Yes. So it's easier for you because your experience yeah. with them was yeah. not as horrible. And Do you understand why there are those survivors who will never forgive? Yeah, very easily. I've heard some say that they can forget for now 
to get through their day to day, but they will never forgive and they will never let it go. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. I understand. Do you, do you look at your situation as being serendipitous and luck? Luck, timing? luck, luck. Luck, good timing. Yes, good timing. The wherewithal and it was, the it was the mayor of the town who was the biggest Nazi who had somebody come to my father to tell him to leave. They tell him to leave. You have the papers get out. We didn't finish packing our, our furniture. A maid did it for us, former maid. We just left. And what did your parents tell you you were doing? Leaving? Leaving because it's time. See, they didn't go into details. Only afterwards I heard they told me. When you talk to other survivors outside of the guilt, do you feel like you can offer something to them now? I can stand by them and talk to them. For instance, I'm a very good friend of Elizabeth Lemoore who can't come. She broke right. her right. hip bone and uh, she went through hell. So when she talks to you about it, you're a friend to her. I feel. As, a, as another Jewish woman, as a, as a friend. Yeah. But you don't. I feel why don't. was I saved and. Not her. Not her. I mean, the last few. Oh, month, I was not home. I was away in school. That was purely Jewish kids. And we were more or less isolated in that house. There was a, a couple. The man was a cripple and his wife and they worked in the garden. They were allowed to work there. And uh, once a week, two kids could go into town. And sometimes we could go take a walk on a Saturday away from town. But otherwise, Was, and, and I had relatives in Munich, and I used to go visit them and go around Munich. I mean, nobody knew me. So this way I uh, could walk around. My mother had a cousin who was a physician. He was an... an um, uh, anesthesiologist and he also had a friend in the in the party and when he heard that they were going to be sent away he committed suicide and took his whole family along rather than having to go into a camp And my uncle from Munich, who was in America and was an American citizen, gave up his English citizenship and had a chance to go to America again. And wouldn't. Why? He had money, he didn't want to leave his money. He also thought that with, he could live it out. What happened? 
He died in Theresienstadt. Greatest feeling is guilt. Yeah, that's about the, the only feeling that I have is is the guilt that. Uh, have you been able to let that go? At times, but when I hear the stories, then I, you know, people talk about it, then I feel. Why did I? Was I lucky? Why? Did I get away with it? I always say I have an angel sitting on my shoulder. And my parents at that time, around that time, there was that Munich uh, meeting in Munich with Chamberlain and Mussolini and all that. And they had my, my clothes packed in case they couldn't get out, that I could get out, because I was the only one who had, my, who had the passport. My parents had to pay whatever was, was left over from the sale of the house, which was not much at the time. And only after they paid every cent did they get back there. passports, and we had the Gestapo sitting in the business, going over the books, and when the bookkeeper said, look, I take care of the books, I know what's going on, Mr. Marx doesn't, keeps a, a straight business, I'm here for that many years, and I know exactly what's going on, they threw her out told her, don't come back. We're not interested. You sound like you had an amazing father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>